Hi, my name is Nathan Weisskopf. Welcome back to the Postcards of History YouTube channel. Uh, it's been quite a while since I've uploaded, and I know I keep promising to make uploads a little more regular. Um, life just keeps happening to get in the way. But today, I'm happy to reveal um, a project that has long been in the making. Uh, it doesn't have an official title yet. I'm not sure if I ever will come up with an official title for it. So for now, uh, the working title is just the Postcards of History podcast. Um, kind of the premise is... I want to share uh, the reenacting hobby as a whole. I want to share the hard work of other reenactors and get their stories out there. So you can kind of think of it like an interview, but for the most part, um, these guests will just be talking about what they do, why they're passionate about it. Um, if they have reenacting units, obviously the relevant information if you'd like to join. Uh, but without further ado, uh, I would like to reveal the first ever guest, my good friend Tyler Ware. And here you are, Tyler. Oh, I just screwed the scenes up. That's going to become a habit with this uh, with this podcast early on. But here he is. And uh, take it away, Tyler. All right. Uh, thanks. Uh, my name's Tyler. Uh, I represent the uh, 89th Salerno Brigade. Uh, we do World War I Italian uh, living histories. As of now, uh, we have our own property out in Virginia. We're trying to build our own trench systems to start hosting some Alpine tacticals, possibly even some Western Front. Uh, something interesting about this impression that not a lot of people know about, uh, we represent one of the few units in the Italian Army that actually served on the Western Front uh, from April uh, 1918 all the way to April 1919 when they finally demobilized. Uh, this impression, uh, I started about two years ago. Uh, I actually came across it on accident. I think it started, I'm a little blurry, but I actually think it started originally with Battlefield 1. I saw some of the Italian uniforms in the game, thought they looked really cool, so I did some research because at that point I was starting to become a little bit of a history buff. Um, uh, you know, just started looking more into the Italian effort in World War One. came across a, a good friend who had started a unit, and, uh, you know, sooner or later I joined, and about two years in the making, this is my primary impression. I take to every event that I possibly can with the exception of a couple of my secondary impressions uh, take over. But as far as uh, equipment goes, it's surprisingly not too much cheaper or more expensive than most other kits run in terms of World War I. Uh, a lot of this stuff has to be custom made. Some of the smaller details have to be reworked. Um, but you can find most vendors don't sell Italian equipment, so there are very few places to actually get everything. Uh, fortunately, that actually does narrow everything down where if you see German World War II, um, French World War I, there's lots of different places where you can get everything, so you have a big variation in terms of your uh, unit's uniformity. So thankfully, that's a bit of a blessing and a curse with us. We only have a couple places to get everything, so availability is low, but in the end, we look very uniform as a unit, and uh, it works out very well for us. That's something really similar with, like, a... Uh austro-hungarian reenacting where there are like there are obviously a lot of vendors that will just custom make you stuff like uh you and i have been discussing the the guy that's custom making me some of the pilot stuff and obviously there's plenty of people like that who will do custom work and make units very specific things um but the nice thing about both austro-hungarian italian reenacting is like you if if i'm not mistaken it's um oh what's the name uh it's a tailor in Italy. He also makes some Austro-Hungarian stuff, but it's far less. And now I've just drawn a blank on his name, but I'm pretty sure that's where you guys get a lot of, um, at least the equipment I think you get from him. Um, it's not Rizzi Online. It's, uh, I can't believe I've forgotten the name when I was trying to make a point of it, but uh, it is something two, that's nice. Uh, I, I'm not sure which one you're thinking of. The two that come to mind in terms of that are uh, Sartoria Equipe. That's it. And, that's it. Uh, that's it. Sartoria. Yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah, they make a lot of... They, I mean, they're Italian. I've seen some of their Italian stuff. It's, like, fantastic. It's I, I considered getting an Austro-Hungarian uniform w uh, from them at one point, but I went with Yarda. But, it's yeah, it's an interesting thing where both of them are kind of niche impressions that are not necessarily more expensive than other impressions, but it's certainly harder to get into them due to that higher barrier of entry on the, uh, the research of finding vendors. But once you do, then it's everyone kind of looks the same because everyone's buying from the same people. That uh, that goes back to what I said earlier about it being a blessing and a curse. Uh, on, you know, on one hand, 
you don't have as much people drawn into it for the fact that they can't necessarily customize as much of the impression as they want. They've got a lot more stricter regulations. Uh, the Italians were one of the few militaries in World War I that wore the same uniform all the way throughout the war. There was no major change to the uniform, with the exception of a few minor outliers in terms of you know, specialty units like the, the Carbinieri or the Arditi. They adopted some changes. Uh, the Arditi weren't even formed until during the war. But um, as far as the main infantry impression goes, you know, steel helmets, gas masks, everything that other armies didn't have before the war is really the only thing that changed with the Italians. Uh, as far as that being um, a bad thing, though, you, uh, you don't get as many people drawn towards an impression that they have, you know, minimal customization, fewer places to look. It's a lot harder to find everything. They want to put it together as quick as they can. Uh, thankfully, though, it is, like you said, it's not super expensive. But the good thing about that is that um, it also allows you to have more talking points at Living Histories and stuff, which is mostly what I attend. Uh, people are, the, the public likes to be drawn to stuff they don't necessarily see very often. Uh, so if you see, you know, German World War II or French Zouaves, you're going to go to the Zouaves because, you know, you think, you know, who are these guys? I want to go see what this is first. Um, so, again, there's, there's so many good and bad things about doing a real obscure impression. But, you know, in the end, it kind of weighs out even. That's something... Um... That's something I, I also wanted to say I found really uh, impressive about you and, and kind of I'd say we're falling into the similar vein now because I'm kind of trying to do the really weird specialized stuff of Austria hunger where there's not a lot of official vendors for it. But you're like your specialized uh, Italian like the, the aviator uniform and the Navy stuff is really impressive because I mean, I'll be honest, I don't know anything about it and uh, and I don't know if it looks right. But from from how the Austro-Hungarians looked at the time, and I know there's there are not a lot of similarities, but some, the look does you you have the look down. I'm sure it might not be perfect, but just the way you've managed to find, you, I think you said the the aviator jacket was just like some converted leather jacket, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. The uh, I I actually the aviator jacket uh, was the one that I ended up converting even further to be used for my navy impression. Oh, so, really? Okay. I was not necessarily looking at, um, you know, time, like, uh, period accurate regulations and military dress and orders and everything like that. The, I hate to say the majority of that stuff was pure guesswork based off original photos. Most of those real obscure ones are, you know, blurry, hard to find. Uh, you can't really see a whole lot of details in them. Uh, the Navy impression even more or less than the... Uh, the aviator. Fortunately, there's a lot of photos of the aviator kit. Uh, nobody actually makes the leather jacket, so like you said, that is one of the few items that has to be custom made. The Navy impression was thrown together with lookalikes and surplus. Thankfully, I've been told by one of my actual Italian friends over there, he's got a, a nice photo collection, he said the impression is very passable. There are a few minor changes, such as the way the hat insignia is stitched on, the actual leather jacket itself, the buttons and everything like that, but for the most part, I was thankfully able to put together the general impression and make it work with what few information I had. That's something that you find a lot with like the the niche impressions in general. Like really, it, it it's only I I mean to me the only impressions that come to mind are some of the bigger World War II ones and then maybe Civil War Rev War at least here in the U.S. where there's not only I mean Civil War and Rev War obviously don't really have photographic evidence, but there's such a wealth of historical account and, and good depictions and people that have been researching it for so long already and that have made their information public that it's not too hard to get, as you said, a passable impression. But with uh especially if the Austro Hungarians uh, and Italians, I don't know if the Italians are the same way, but at least if the Austro Hungarians, their pilots, they didn't actually have any official dress regulations. So it's really hard to narrow down what counts as a what would count as a passable impression or something you feel comfortable presenting as an accurate portrayal because there there was no set standard necessarily the only set standard i'm aware of with the austro-hungarian aviation is just that they wore obviously the, when they're not in the air they wore the traditional army uniform with uh, a special set of collar tabs if even the collar tabs were available um 
So is, is that the same with the Italians where a lot of the specialized branches didn't necessarily have like super strict dress, dress regulations or did they still maintain kind of a level of professionalism that other armies uh, necessarily did, such as, I guess, the Germans? Uh, it, it would be a, a bit of a mix uh, depending on what unit we're talking about. For example, the, the RDD, they were formed in 1916. Uh, they adopted the, um, the early war Bersaglieri tunic, the, the two chest pockets, the belt loops and everything. They utilized that from the moment they were formed to all the way even after the war until they were disbanded. That was their uniform of choice. That became the norm for them. Uh, as far as the aviator goes, it actually um, it was a bit of a shift from one to the other. Uh, when Italy first took to the skies, they did not have a standard aviation, you know, the leather uniform. Uh, like you said, same with the Austro-Hungarians, they wore this traditional army tunic. Uh, depending on what um, air branch you were a part of, you'd have different collar insignia, like what I'm wearing now. But the leather jackets were mostly early in the war. I've The only accounts I've been able to read, which is two or three, uh, really, really short, not very detailed. And I have had one guy that said uh, his grandfather, actually, he remembers him telling him this uh, when he was younger, they actually pressed a lot of civilian jackets into service early on in the war until they were able to develop their own official uh, aviator jacket because that wasn't necessarily a priority for Italy, especially around the time of 1915, 1916, when they were, they kind of had their hands full. They were, you know, they were getting demolished almost everywhere they went for the first half of the war. Yeah. Well, I'm going to... I don't want to get too drawn off on a tangent that I started, so I'm going to put the focus back on you and let you talk specifically about your impression. I know it's kind of an infantry kit, so I'll let you talk through the equipment and stuff. Um, and yeah, I mean, I might interject, but I won't switch back to the dual camera mode. I'll just interject and let you let you talk. So here the focus is back on you, so take it away. So um, this uniform that I'm wearing is a 1918, um, or excuse me, this is the 1917. I have the uh, Polivalente gas mask on right now. The 1918 variant, uh, after the Battle of Caporetto, the, the Italian army as a whole would have adopted the uh, British small box respirator gas mask due to them encountering a, a multitude of German heavier gases than what the Austro-Hungarians had been previously using. Uh, the Italian domestically produced gas mask was not quite as effective as the SBR, so they uh, switched that to standard issue. So the 1918 kit would have the uh, British SBR, and uh, the Western Front Italian kit would uh, also likely adopted the M2 gas mask. We don't have definitive proof of whether or not that was an official direct order, but there are photos of the Italians wearing it and not wearing it, so it's likely that it was the same case as the United States Marines, where they just picked it up if they could as a secondary gas mask. Uh, because, again, some people don't know this, but when the, the small box respirator is broken, it has to be sent back to repair, or you have to just get a new one entirely. So there very well could be a period where you either have a faulty gas mask, or you don't have one at all if supply lines are not steady. Um, the helmet is the French pr uh, produced Adrian helmets, the 1915, you can tell by it's got the uh, the bolted on uh, spine and the uh, the rim right here on the helmet. In 1916, the Italians did, uh, in order to sort of save money, they started domestically producing their own helmet called the Lipman model. Uh, it was a single piece of stamped steel the spine was welded on, and they completely did away with this rim because they didn't feel it was necessary. As far as liner and chin strap goes, it was the uh, absolute same. Uh, 1909 tunic, trousers, and the um, uh, the mantello, or the cape. Uh, the Italians did not have a great coat that was issued as a, um, a primary piece of kit. It was mostly reserved for troops serving in colder climates, so it wasn't really something that you would see every troop carrying, unlike almost every other nation at the time. Um, one thing I'm not too certain about that I hate to say is the uh, the white cravat that I have right here. I don't know if you heard that. My phone made a weird noise. Sorry about that. Um, but the white cravat that I'm wearing, I can only speculate that it is a cravat and not an undershirt. Uh, the undershirts that I typically see, the Italians uh, not wearing their tunics, they do not have a very high-rise collar. I don't know if it was uh, an extended collar, the undershirt that could be tailored. I don't know um, if it was a cravat or if that was the standard undershirt. There's not a whole lot of period photos with Italians not wearing the tunics. And when they do, they all seem to have about the same length as the German 
undershirt, which I'm wearing right now, and you wouldn't be able to see above the collar. So that's one of those pieces, again, where you just kind of have to speculate and really just kind of guesswork and make it look as close as possible that you can. Um, but as far as the actual equipment goes, like I said, the Italians were one of the few nations to not really change a whole lot of their basic uniform, uh, with the exception of the gas mask and the helmet. Almost everything else, uh, pre-war bread bag, pre-war webbing, pouches, uniform, 1907, 1909 is when most of this stuff started to come out. Um, they did have a, um, they did have a, a, a high-rise boot, and they did not use putties until around 19, late 1915, 1916. So they would originally have a much taller boot and uh, ankle-length pants. And as the war progressed, they started to issue out the Alpini pants, which only come to about mid-calf to uh, infantry and RDD troops as well, because it was uh, less material, it was a little bit cheaper to make, and they already had a surplus of them at the time. Uh, but as far as um, everything else goes, there's really not much more to the Italian kit than there is to any other kit. You've got a rucksack. You've got, um, you actually don't have a great coat, like I said earlier. You have the, uh, the mantello, which would take its place, blanket roll, tent. Everything else stays about the same. There wasn't really anything that I can think of specifically that the Italians were issued um, that really stands out as opposed, as far as infantry goes. Now, the Alpini and the RDD would obviously, they would get, you know, hand warmers, gloves, coats. Uh, the RDD would have their knives and grenades, the carbines. Uh, but everything else stayed about the same all throughout the war, thankfully. So this impression on its own can work from about 1916 to 1918. And the only thing you really have to change out is the gas mask. Yeah, let me switch back to two camera now. Um, I was thinking, um, crap, I was thinking of a question. Um, so yeah, I, oh yeah, the comment I was going to say is, like you said, it's, there's not too much that differs it from a lot from other kits, especially of the World War One era. The thing where it gets really interesting, and the thing that I think you excel a lot at from displays not only I've seen you post, but obviously I've done an event with you now, is you've done an amazing job getting the small details, the things that the things that separate each country from each other. So like you had the newspapers, you had the unique clubs, and um, you know the smaller trench art type pieces. That's where it kind of shifts from. Oh, you know, I threw this to get, I threw this impression together, and and now I have another impression. To, this is actual living history, and I think that's something your group uh, does really well at, because every every single member I've seen of the Salerno does the exact same level of work that you do. It's something that I I'm, I'll be completely honest, I'm a little envious of, because it's very difficult for me to find the same level of detail for, um, uh, my impressions, but uh. I, I do think it's really unique that despite all the different fronts and uh, conditions in World War One, pretty much every army stayed roughly the same in their equipment. I mean, they all had the same, they had different looks, but they had the same sort of philosophy at their core of what an infantryman should carry. And that's obviously what you portray. That's what I'm usually portraying. Um, um, so yeah, thank, that's a, a great, uh, great overview of the equipment. I guess you kind of already... For the for the viewers, we had like I have like a little script to go through. I guess you already kind of went why you went into it with uh, Battlefield One and um, and just seeing some of the media and, and being interested in history. And honestly, that's a similar motivation on my end. Obviously, my I, I have a little bit more family motivation, but I do think that like as far as World War One reenacting as a whole goes, I guarantee like half the half the World War One reenactors that are our age in America are like the ultimate core goes back to playing battlefield one back in 2016. And that's where it all started. Um, but yeah, I've, talk, I've talked to probably at least 10 people that I can name right off the bat that have said the same thing. Um, <laughs> a couple of members in Salerno that, uh, they have, uh, there's one guy, I believe he had two grandfathers in the Italian army in world war one, uh, might've been a grandfather and an uncle. I can't remember, but we do have a couple of members that have family lineage all the way back until then. So, we do kind of have a wide variety of why everyone started. And that's another reason I like reenacting as a whole is because almost everybody has a different answer as to why they started doing what they do. Oh yeah. Abs I mean, absolutely. I mean, cause there's, there are certain people that it's, it's just for fun. It's, I mean, it's just like a different hobby. They don't, they don't, it's not that they don't care about the history. They don't care about respecting it. It's just that for them, it's just 
it's a way to get out on the weekend. And uh, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's it's an amazing hobby. Uh, and I, I think I've honestly probably made more great memories with I've only been to four events thus far. Um, than I have in a, a lot of years of my life of just, just the, the goofy stuff that goes on. And actually that leads us into, into the other question I was forgetting favorite story from an event. Uh, if you had to choose. Event, uh, I, I've not yet been to a tactical, uh, in this, in this kit yet. Uh, there's one coming up in October, uh, in the Midwest. I'm going to try and make it if I can. So hopefully I'll have a story from that later on. Um, I think my favorite story would probably be from uh, my secondary kit, which was originally my primary kit before this, is my World War I German. Uh, I attend Newville every year whenever I can, uh, one of the biggest events in the U.S. that I can think of. Uh, I remember it was, it was a Saturday morning. Uh, we had our first charge of the evening, or not the evening, uh, first charge in the morning. Uh, you know, we had our, our stern battalions go out first, cut some of the wire. We had gas sent over the top and everything. So when we actually climbed out of the trenches and started walking into the field. That was my first, like, whoa, this is, this is extremely immersive. Like, this puts, this puts history in perspective for me. Because when you're out there, this was in November up in the north, by the way. So when you're out there at night, it's 15 degrees, you've got frostbite, you feel like, you know, you can't feel your toes. You're just standing around waiting for something to happen. You're hungry, you're tired, uh, your water pump broke, and nobody knows why. That's another true story. Um, so you get the full German experience when you haven't eaten or drank or showered in three days, at the very minimum. Uh, but it really puts it, it really puts it in perspective. So I think my favorite memory would be my first tactical at Newville because it really, really spoke to me. Like, you know, at any given point, if I get hurt or if I get uncomfortable or if this becomes too much, I can leave. I can go home to a warm bed. I can eat a hot meal. These guys didn't have that choice. They were out there, you know rotating for weeks at a time doing this so that that really spoke to me on a different level like you know i do this i do the tacticals for fun obviously but when i go to living histories i use my perspective that i gained from the tacticals to teach people about what these men actually went through um how they fought how they lived how they died and what that means for us and why we should remember it that's a, that's an awesome answer like you know, I was expecting like Goofy. Uh, uh, I saw I saw some World War II German pulling Airborne's pants down, but like that was that was a way better quality answer than uh, I think most people would give. And um, I think that's the reason I'm so excited. Um, obviously, you are. It's, I guess more me and Grant are talking about it because Grant is one of the leaders of Salerno. But um, I'm really excited to try and get some form of Italian uh, Austrian tactical going. Because getting into the hobby, I never thought I'd really be that interested in the tactical side of things. But it's stories like that that make me realize the value of them towards the living history side. Where it's you get the perspective, even just an, an ounce of it, that you can contribute to educating people. Um, and ultimately, I think at the core of at least you and I's goal of what we do, it's education. Um, and... Yeah, I, I was actually going to ask, completely unrelated. You said there's a tactical in the Midwest. Is it a Western Front tactical? Because I was about to say, if it's an if it's an Italian Front thing, you gotta you gotta invite me. It it is a, it is a Western Front tactical. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, they will have they will have a couple more obscure units. I think they have the Russian Expeditionary Force. A couple of those guys are showing up. Uh, there will be me and I think two other Italians as of now from a totally different unit that are planning to show up. So um, I'm I'm really hoping. Um, I'm really hoping we can work together with them. My, if they're not even part of an official unit, probably going to try and recruit them as well. So, so um, yeah, I guess another question I wanted to ask, just uh, both for my own comparison and for people watching, if they're interested in joining, how many members does Salerno have officially? I mean, obviously there's always people that are interested or working on it, but like official members with complete kits, do you know? Um, with complete kits, I think we have approaching 10 or 15 people. Okay. Or, or I've got a minimum kit right now. Uh, a couple of us, like, I, I've tried to flesh out my kit as much as I can. I've got the rucksack, you know, the shoe cleaning kit. The, I've even got the gray coat, a World War II repro gray coat that I've tried to convert a little bit. Um, it's it's passable, I guess. I really hate to say that, but, uh, it's, again, it's one of those things you just kind of have to deal with. Uh, but we do have a couple members right now, I think about 10 or 15 of them that have the basic kit. Uh 
actually, you know, enlisted men. I think we have, last I checked, was around 20, 25 guys. So we're all, almost halfway to getting everybody equipped. That's really impressive. I'm pretty sure that's, I'm pretty sure that's almost, that might not be bigger than uh, KUK IR-63, but that's probably, even, that's probably rivaling the size of even some of the bigger Austro-Hungarian units in the U.S. Um, well, yeah, I mean... For anyone listening that's interested, you have a you have a wealth of you have a wealth of knowledge that you'd be walking into if you joined Salerno. Um, but I'm trying to think. I mean, honestly, I think this has gone really smoothly. Um, you, I couldn't have asked for a better first guest. So thank you for thank you for coming on on short notice. It's literally right now outside my house. It's the hurricane weather, and uh, I don't. You're probably you're probably far enough away in Tennessee where it's not hitting you, but um. Yeah, we, yeah, we originally we, we got... planned to go on a hike this weekend, and because of the weather, didn't work out. But we at least got this, and we got it on short notice. So I really, I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Um, and I guess, yeah, I mean, I guess this will be our our closing uh, remarks. I mean, do you have anything anything more to add? Um, uh, if I had any advice for living historians, anybody interested in that, I would. Uh, I know, like you said, you didn't really expect to be part of the tactical side. Uh, I went into the same mindset. My first tactical completely changed that. So if I was to say anything, I would go right back to that. Try to go to at least one or two tacticals in your lifetime. Get that experience as you know, numb as it may be to the true thing. You get you get a lot more talking points out of it, and you really do start to understand why this is so important that we teach this. Well, great, Tyler. Thank you so much for coming on. I look forward. I look forward to seeing you at whatever event we can actually manage to get out together, or if we can just get out on a hike. Really look forward to it. But um, with that all being said, uh, I really appreciate you tuning into the first ever attempt at a podcast on this channel. Um, if it gets good response, then I plan to be doing more in the future. Um, so with that all being said, thanks for watching. You guys have a great day.